his name is Dan Freeberg. Dan is the founder and president of Premier Crops, LLC. And uh, Dan is an Iowa State grad and an Iowa native, just like I am. And uh, that's maybe the only things we have in common, Dan. Uh, I'm not sure. But oh, the facial hair, too, yes. Yeah, so. so anyway, Dan's presentation will be on data-driven agronomic decisions. So please give Dan your full attention. Thank you. It's good to be here. Can everybody hear? If not, I'm coming to exchange the seat for that. Are you good? Can you hear all right? Perfect. So it's great to be here and thank you for uh, being part of it. This is kind of our mission as a company is, that, is to assist growers and their trusted agronomic advisors in creating real value out of the geo-referenced agronomic data that they've been collecting by converting um, that data to knowledge to improve production practices in an economic and sustainable manner. So we started in 1999, so we're in our 15th crop year. Historically, we've marketed through um, select advisors, primarily employed by retailers. Uh, I describe us very much as an agronomy company that looks like a software company. We own our own software, it's web-based, it kind of gives us unlimited geography, but we're very Midwest focused because a lot of our attention has been driven to use the yield file to analyze the results. So, because we're so yield file driven, it kind of ties us to crops that have a geo-reference yield file. You can pretty much put any layer in the system and analyze any layer, agronomic, economic, and weather. A lot of our customers are large um, and successful retailers in their market area. Many are considered to be industry leaders in, in uh, offering precision ag services and quality agronomic advice. And we're very much willing and are the behind the scenes technology provider to some of the real powerhouses um, in Precision Ag. I just happen, we have a team behind me sometimes, I, because I'm the one, the one that's in front a lot, uh, people think it's just me, but we have a team and I just have to be the prettiest and that's why I get to present. Some of those people are in the room and attending, but uh, there's about 15 of us and we're growing rapidly. I grew up on a farm in, in Iowa, and I'll share a little bit of that experience with you in a little bit. They pulled out of Iowa State, they wholesale fertilizer for three years, retail for eight years, left retail to run the Trade Association in Iowa, the Fertilizer and Chemical Association, and merged it with Grain and Feed and the Agribusiness Association, which meant I was a lobbyist and heavily involved in public affairs debates. Um, left that to start doing business consulting. A lot of those businesses we were working with were retailers who were trying to transition their businesses from bundling all their agronomic services with input sales and commodities to try to launch four charge services. And to this day, and maybe what we do best as a company is help customers go to the market with a four charge sustainable program uh, where they generate revenue to pay for the, the staff. I, I shared a little bit that I grew up on a farm in, in Iowa, so I was nine when my father died. My mother kept us on the farm and we raised pigs. And this is old school, and this is how we raised pigs. And so I grew up at nine feeding pigs this way, which was what a lot of people want to argue that we should go back to. But my experience in raising pigs this way is that a lot of times when we would feed pigs in open lots and we would just put the feed out, I happened to notice even at a young age that a lot of the bigger sows or the bigger pigs would push the smaller ones out of the way and eat more feed. And so even back then, the quest was to do it better. And so one of my earlier recollections is that we built feeding stalls. And we built feeding stalls. And, and you can almost tell this was just old pipe that we welded together to have these old stalls. But the reason we built feeding stalls was because of this dynamic of if we just put the same amount of food out for all the sows, the little sows didn't get enough. It was especially dear to me, and the reason I remember it is my initial 4-H project was a sow, and I was lucky enough that she was incredibly productive, and she had huge litters, and because she had huge litters, she fed those litters well, and she was always the smallest sow, and I, and I always wanted to give her more food, and until we got to this, which really is pre-confinement, I guess this is pre industrial, but you can, set, you can tell that big white sow versus the one next to it. It was all about the ability to feed. To, it was all, for, for me, even at that time, um, it was just about the, the, the desire to do things better. 
And that's really, I, you know, I look back and, I, you know, I'm a big home improvement buff. I just love to improve things. And it's not competitive. It's not that I want to do it better than everybody else. I just want to do it better. And I think that's what we all have in common here, even though we work for different companies and we all have different perspectives and different ways to go to the market. But this, this precision ag umbrella really is just about doing it better. In the days when I was growing up, there was a story told, and, it, and I did a lot of that kind of uh, for youth, youth speaking at the time involved in FFA and 4-H and, and did a fair amount of that, but there's a story told that really resonated with me about the, the farm family that moved to a new farm and they, so they just moved into this new farm and the twins, they had twin boys who were getting ready to uh, come of age where they could start doing farm work and the dad said, uh, sons, it's time for you to learn how to do farm work. And we've got this new barn, and I want you guys to go out and clean the, clean the barn. And so they walked into this new barn, and it was full of manure. It was full of manure. Well, the two twins, one was an optimist and one was a pessimist. And the pessimist, of course, just was pretty upset because he just saw this as a barn full of manure. And so he was begrudging that, that activity. But the optimist, he just tore into it. He was shoveling manure like crazy. And the dad comes by a little bit and just, it's like, what's going on? Why, why are you so excited? He says, this much manure, there's got to be a pony in there. <laughs> and that's kind of what's going on with big data. And the, the buzz about big data is there, all of a sudden, in the 15 years we've been in business, there's a whole bunch of people who have decided that what we're doing in precision ag data analysis, there's got to be a pony in there. But it's way beyond the pony. There's got to be some thoroughbreds in there, right? So, so this big data thing is all about finding the ponies or finding the thoroughbreds uh, in that pile of what some people would call uh, manure. So we've been 15 years. So Premier Crop has been 15 years of creating ponies out of this data. The reason I the reason I say, the reason I say that some people would see what we're doing, and, and I, I'm trying to come up with the right word, but you get the idea. So what we do, what we do is, is build this data set, for, and you'll see it in more detail in a little bit, but it's this data set that is the real world collision, the real world collision of all the different things that interact in real world agronomy. And for a whole bunch of people who have been technically trained by land-grant universities and got their PhDs, what Premier Crop does is take a room full of crap and create value out of it, find the ponies in the data. So if you will, indulge me as we go down this path of trying to show you how maybe we can go about finding ponies in the data. But the real key, maybe if, if you're a note taker, if you're a note taker in presentations, this is, this is the one you want to write down, is that what I'm talking about today and what Premier Crop is all about is really a fundamental change because our history in precision ag has been about applying existing knowledge spatially versus what I'm talking about is not just doing that, but I'm talking about using spatial data to create new agronomic knowledge that in turn can be applied spatially. So I'll give you the standard elevator speech and take you down a little path to show you a little bit of what Premier Crop's all about. This for some of you will be redundant because you've seen presentations and I have customers in the room and I apologize for being boring, but GPS technology allows us to measure all this variability, but what we commonly find, especially as we go into new markets, is that growers are accumulating notebooks full of maps and hard drives full of files. And if you do this enough, you just your ability to collect lots of maps is overwhelming. And what we like to say is that the true power is the data behind the map. Every map, every map has a data file behind it. And, and the value, the value of what we do, the value of what we do is to organize the data behind every map. Maps are a wonderful way to visualize data, but we believe the true power is in the data. So we organize the data into a standard format that allows us to generate reports that can be standardized and we can share information like what's the relationship between yield and soil test fertility or yield in any management practice. Sometimes people laugh and they make fun of my slides 
and this is one of them that some people make fun of, but it is maybe the most important slide, and it is my world and, and what I believe the real world is. So real world agronomy is very integrated. Long, long time ago, Paul Fixon in a group like that and taught me the, the, the balanced fertility, the balanced fertility message, and the rain barrel was popular in my old days. But the idea of the rain barrel was that it didn't make any sense. It didn't make any sense to manage phosphorus at this level if potassium was yield limiting. It didn't make any sense to apply nitrogen, over apply nitrogen if potassium was what was yield limiting. The problem with the rain barrel at the time is that it was, it was a message on balanced fertility, but we never rotated the rain barrel. So if you rotate the rain barrel, what you find is that there's a whole bunch of management factors that are just as significant as fertility. So, so in the real world, when I talk about this collision of all these agronomic layers of data and all these agronomic practices, it's not one thing. It's never one thing. There is no magic bullet because every field, field by field, within every field, what matters, what limits yield changes. Is singulation, is, is singulation drive yield? Sure, if singulation is the lowest state on the rain barrel, singulation is the, is the one that drives yield variability. Farmers are bombarded by all these yield claims. And the reality is it's very difficult. It's very difficult to substantiate and prove that at a farm level what drives yield. And it's because of the rain barrel. So because of the respect for the rain barrel, Premier Crab, way before we had this big database and this big data set, we built the deepest data set. So what we were all about was not, not about, I mean, it was kind of this respect for real world agronomy, but it led us to just collect a lot of data. So 400 potential layers. That sounds absurd, but 52 of them are weather, growing degree days, and units, and rainfall by week. Applied nitrogen sounds like one layer, but it's not. It's every time you apply it, it's rate, source, timing, additive. So a hybrid variety might sound like one, but it's company, number, uh, relative maturity, traits, all those things combined. So deep data for us, because that's what it took to really have serious data analysis. How does it happen? This, this barn full is built this way. Uh, starts with geo-reference boundaries, um, hierarchy. Uh, for us, for us, a big piece of this is geo-reference samples. So virtually all our data would have some type of a spatial soil sample because, we, and I talk a lot about fertility, and it's 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 twofold. One is that fertility is a huge dollar investment for growers, and so managing fertility is spatially and using precision ag tools has never ever paid as fast as it does now. Uh, the other part of it though is that fertility differences are huge yield drivers. So far more than most people in the room will recognize fertility is, is a big piece of what's driving yield. We add soils, we bring in planting data off of everybody's monitor, everybody's device. So right before this I attended the Ag Gateway debate, <coughs> talk discussion and and so any, anything that happens here and the ability to have standardized data format just makes all of this much easier. Um, so, we, so we build a data file for each field each year. We try to organize data into a database structure that lets you see layers and, and relationships that were hard to see before. We provide analysis at a field level, a grower level, and then across hundreds of thousands of confidentially pooled acres. We understand that correlation doesn't always equal cause and effect. What we're doing is new to agronomy. It's called observational data analysis versus traditionally replicated plots. This is my example of perfect correlation, but I can't prove that one, or I can't prove the cause and effect. So this is, this is me out of college versus today. There's lots of sciences that don't, that don't lend themselves to plots, and so they would have similar analysis to us, economics. Human medicine, in many cases, is observational data analysis. I want to talk just a little bit about some of the ways we use data, just to give you a little bit more flavor, and then I'll jump back into uh, talking about the big data analytics. But um, one of our fastest growing trends from 2005, and it started with some of the people in this room asking us to help them with variable rate seeding. So their farmers had planters that were capable of changing population as they went through the field, and the question was, how do I drive that decision? Uh, so we started in 2005, and this is how it's evolved, and this is some of our messaging. Uh, 
Um, we, we like to divide the field into management zones. In some cases, it's only two field or two management zones. In some, it's four or five. But in general, these three catch a lot of fields. Um, so, so the A zone is the sweet spot of the field. It's the best part of the field. It's the part of the field that you want to be more aggressive in. So we call this the ABCs of management zones. We talk a lot about A zones because that's where everybody's so excited about. It's the part of the field you just want to push harder. B zones are kind of field average. C zones are maybe the area of the field that something else is yield limiting. So A might stand for aggressive, C might stand for conservative. A zones, again, if they're just drainage is right, keep A horizon, otherwise they wouldn't handle the swings in weather. Um, for me, they're at least 20 bushel or 10% higher yield part of the field you want to push harder. My favorite way to do it is this, which is using historic yield. The reason I love using yield is because every other layer or combinations of layers that we have in the database are theoretical. Yield is not a theory, it's how the field actually performs, so we just have an easy web-based tool that lets customers aggregate or uh, build a, a combined year yield map, and they can quickly blend those multiple year yield maps into um, uh, the management zone map, and from there go to variable rate prescriptions. So, part probably um, back in 2005, the most important thing we did is we we didn't we didn't think we knew we didn't think we had all the answers, and so we trademarked and launched this concept called learning blocks, which is just to put a check block in the planning prescription, so at the end of the year we could verify whether we did the right thing or not. So in the green part of the field, the A zone, we're pushing populations. The yellow is the B zone, that's kind of the field average. And the C zone, maybe we're backing off population. But the check blocks are just there, the learning blocks are just there to know whether we did the right thing. So for us, it's, it was this idea of using the yield file and the variable rate prescription and checking our work to see whether it did the right thing. So now we have reports that are standardized as soon as the yield file hits, you can see that your A zone did 212, your B zone 208, your C zone 200, and then the learning blocks down below just, uh, just tell you what the, what the two acres inside the learning block did and the area right around it. So it's just a way of building responsive population curves within a management zone, and it's, it's automated and fairly fast. So for us, it was an aha moment. For us, it was an aha moment as we started building management zones to realize that if we're going to use the yield file to check the work, we need to do the check blocks inside the management zones versus running strips across the field. In our 15-year history, we've done a lot of strip trials, and now we look back on it and realize that we were running those strips across management zones. So picture this. If, you, if you're doing a population study on a field and you're using the strip trial model, you're running your high population strip through your A zone, in your B zone, in your C zone and you get the results back and everything you've gained in your A zone you've lost in your C zone. So, so for us it was just this realization that strip trials don't fit the way fields lay out. Um, a few years ago at InfoAg I presented some of this and University of Illinois researchers came up and shared that they, they were finding exactly the same thing. I grabbed this slide out of their report, but what you see this is, that they just, they're doing replicated blocks within areas of the field. So down here, this is the response to nitrogen. This is ISNT work, but this is their response to nitrogen in this part of the field. And just, just right up the field, this is the response. So, so what they were saying is exactly the same thing, is that, our, that, that what they're starting to see is that, is that if, you, if you do strip trials in this field, you get a mess, but if you do block treatments, it's just a way um, to get, get at the, the idea that within fields there are different response curves. We're doing the same thing now with nutrients as we did with planting. So for us, it's all about uh, it's all about having a system where we use the data file to verify with the grower how what the response to population, what the response to applied nutrients uh, are within a, within a management zone within a field. Again, we talk a lot about A zones. The thing we talk a, a, a lot also about is agronomic synergy. And, and this is something our customers are just in the uh, trenches doing all the time, is integrating all the pieces. So for us, it's not, it's not just enough to do variable rate seeding. You need to integrate that with nutrients. 
And, and our favorite metaphor to illustrate it is one we borrowed from others, but it's if you if you invite more people to dinner, you know, if you have enough, if you have enough food for 10 people and you invite 20, you got somebody's gonna go hungry, right? So so if if you if you keep treating the field as though it's all the same and then you add extra plants, something's gotta give. So for us it's about it's a it's a food metaphor about matching the barrel variety nutrient prescription with um, the seeding prescription and then tying that to the to each unique genetics response. Um, we share this a lot as uh, Bob Shopper, a Winfield agronomist, shared it years ago. But it's, it's basically the idea that as we push populations, as we put this is uh, this is root mass in a 30 inch row out of the answer plot at Truman, Minnesota. But as we push population, we shrink root mass from competitive pressure to plant next door. And we believe this has so much to do with this ABC concept of why we need to treat uh, nutrients different, or differently in different parts of the field. We talk so much about yield as it relates to soil test fertility. Sometimes people get focused on soil test parts per million. And I'm going to show you some slides that are very parts per million soil test focused. But I want you to realize that the goal is that nobody gets paid on changing soil test levels. We get paid on yield. University Rex for me are starting place. They're the foundation of what we know economically, but they shouldn't be the ending place. So what we're talking about is just adding more dimensions to the variable rate nutrient prescriptions. The sad reality, I talked to Bruce before we started this, but the sad reality is the people who leave this, this conference have more spatial data and do more variable rate activity than anyone else, than anyone else in the country. But the reality is most of you would do less than half the acres you company touches apply. We walk into markets not far from here all the time where there is no variable rate activity going on. This is though we're, we're willing to pretend that fields are all uniform. The yield data doesn't say that, and if you grab a good spatial soil sample, it wouldn't say that at all. Remember the, remember the, so this is what we believe is going on. Remember the south story? That small sow of mine, that small 4-H project sow of mine, she was an A-zone sow. So she was incredibly productive. And what happened to that incredibly productive sow if we fed her the same as we fed the C-zone sow? The C-zone sow, because she wasn't producing much, she got big, she filled up, right? The A-zone sow never could catch up. It's the same metaphor, it's the same metaphor in our field. These sweet spots, these most productive parts of the field are incredibly responsive to nutrients. They're incredibly responsive. That's why, that's why they just keep pulling the higher and higher yields that we're taking off of them. And the higher and higher yields we're taking off of them just keeps pulling down the nutrients. Agronomic decision making before what we're talking about, and really the foundation that most of you would probably use to make decisions right now, is that we would, we would use our traditional land grant university recommendations and our seed company's recommendation. And those are all based on mostly off of plot data. And agronomic decision making in our history has been that we do a, we've observed yield in a treatment area, and that treatment area could be you know, you know, it could be a nutrient application area, a crop protection area, a soil type variety. So we've been doing this plot thing for a long time. It's a, it's a model that served us well. It's a great way to connect people and visualize the data. But I want to tell you, even though plots lend themselves to randomization and replication of statistical model, plots have limitations. And one of them is that they have to be incredibly small. So a lot of people don't realize how small plots are. There's a lot of 25 and 50 foot hand, hand thin plots because, because we're trying to eliminate variability in the plot environment, right? So we have, in order to have replication, in order to have randomization, we have to have tiny, tiny plots. Uh, the, the Winfield system, the, the, the answer plot system, maybe is the most extensive nationwide plot system. And it's really well done. And one of the things that you'll pick up on if you pay attention to what they do is that they figured out a long time ago that even in the plot environment, you can have unintended consequences. Meaning, if you stack, if you happen to get a short hybrid next to a tall hybrid, you better be careful because that tall hybrid can shade the short one, and you could you could mask true response. And so, 
they plant four rows but only harvest two rows to get the data. We had a customer go to school on that, and he, he did the same thing, and he quantified it, and in one case it was 7.7 .7 bushels less, meaning the shading effect was seven bushel, almost eight bushel less, 33 in another one, 24. Think about how many hybrid, think about how many hybrid plots where people have based data, they've based decisions on where, where great shorter numbers got standard, stood up next to a tall number and the data got reported and the truth is it was the shading effect and not the true measure of a hybrid's performance. Plots are designed to eliminate variability. We had a customer buy a seed company research farm in the last two years and he had a learning block that did 271 that year. And then we looked at the soil test values for that. This is the soil test values off of that major seed company research farm. It's got 340 parts per million average K and 602 average, average P and average K. Which is, which, think about what we're trying to do in plots. We want well-drained, high-fertility environments so that we've eliminated variables, right? But the problem is, the problem is you take, the problem is you take these little tiny 25, 50 foot observations, right? And then you take that and you, you make and you spread them out geographically and you average response. And then we make this huge leap, right? We make this huge leap to pretend, we make this huge leap to pretend that, that those little observations, which I really understand that's the foundation of what we have, but that magically, that magically fits all these A, B, C zones within fields. It fits this amazingly unique geography as we go across the country. So as we try, as we, so as we try to move from that small plot model to a bigger data model, there's going to be a lot of confusion and a lot of difficulty. What we're doing with Premier Crop is, is within every 60-foot cell within a field. So we didn't spray around up here. This was just Photoshop. But we wanted to illustrate what a 60-foot cell looks like in a field. So we aggregate the data this way, and so within every 60-foot area, we would have the average of all the yield points that were collected inside that area, and that would be the average yield value. And then as you cut down through and aggregate it, we would come up with all those other layers of data. So in every, in every field, 100-acre field, So in every hundred acre field, you're going to have a thousand. You're going to have a thousand observations, a thousand times that you've divided the data by the yield file monitor data and all that other data that you've collected underneath it. So a picture, picture in a hundred acre field, a thousand yield observations by all those variables that you're collecting. A three thousand acre grower, which is kind of a typical grower in our system in the Midwest, would have. 30,000 times they have observed yield by all those agronomic characteristics. We have customers with over 100,000 acres in their program, meaning every year they are analyzing the results, both at a field level, you know, at a management zone level, at a field level, at a learning block level, across the grower's operation, but also aggregating in a pool sense or a community sense, so that we can see the same trends across Five million, five million observations over time, or a million local observations a year. I do a terrible job of explaining this sometimes. So when I throw up slides like this, it challenges you know it challenges people because this slide, this data table is at a field level, 153 acre field. In this case, we have color coded the bar chart to match the yield map. So the red cells. The red cells in the field average 225. So you can picture how those are coming together. So all I'm doing is I'm combining the, I'm combining, I'm combining all the, the bottom 10% of the field, which is the bottom 10% of the yield map, into that data table. So the bottom 10% of the field did 225, and all I'm doing is lining up this, all I'm doing is lining up the grid sample information in the same table. If I'm talking to a grower, the, the way I explain it is every grower who's been across the field is, you know, you've been through the parts of the field that are just doing phenomenal and then parts of the field that aren't. And what you really want to do is be able to stop the combine and say, okay, this part of the field is doing 273. What in the world is going on in this part of the field, right? 
And what usually the bad part of the field, you know, but when, when yields are this high, it's pretty tough to pick out what's going on. In this case, the reason this challenges people is yields go from 225 on the bottom 10% to 273 on the top 10%. Soil test P levels go from 27 up to 60. So 27, 29, 34, 50, 60. <coughs> K levels 236 to 295. This field is so far beyond the definition of high fertility, and yet it could be coincidence, right? It could be just an amazing coincidence that this is the story the data is telling. So how do I figure, and then I do the same thing, obviously, on the high yield parts of the field, but I can do the same thing at a grower level. So now I've jumped, now instead of just looking at one field, I'm looking at the relationship on 4,100, almost 4,200 acres of this grower's corn operation for a single year. And I'm saying, if I look at the relationship between yield and soil test fertility, and just split the data by yield range, the bottom 10% of his acres, 400 acres, did 158. The next 20%, 194, on up to the top half, 231, 246, an average of 263. So realize, realize that that, that bottom 10%, the 400 acres, it came from all the, it came from individual cells within all of those different fields. So, so it's almost like you throw all of his data together and you redivide it. You're, you know, you're not talking about pulling in his low yield fields. You're talking about pulling in low yield 60 foot cells. So this could be this could be a coincidence, right? 19, 22, 31. So as I get up to the 263 average, 160, 180, 190, 219, 243. Could be a coincidence. But if you see enough of it, if this is your data, if you're the grower, if you're the local advisor, it probably at some point starts to open up open up possibility that maybe, just maybe, you can do better and pretend that university, university Rex universally fit all this geography. What makes this really powerful? What makes this really powerful when you get out here is when you remember, when you remember that the A zones, a lot of the small cell areas, the A zones, the incredibly productive areas, when you look at them on the data a lot of times, they're actually the lowest fertility. Because years and years and years, we put the same rate on, and we didn't take it off that way. Those A zones are such sweet spots. They're just like that sow. No matter how much you feed her, she just keeps producing on behalf. You know, she just keeps producing. Those sweet spots are that way. So for me to be able to aggregate 4,000 acres across an operation, that means that some, some, of, some of this 263 is actually, it's actually low fertility. Okay? So it's just... It's a ton going on in data. I can do it. I keep going out. You just keep, you start in the field, go grower, go community. So now I'm 500 acres, 500,000 acres uh, by fertility. So the, I, I spend a lot of time on fertility, but hybrid variety obviously is a big part of it. I don't update my slides every year just to keep them the most current 5291, 5259 maybe off the market now. So we have. Our, our data set reflects whatever's planted. We have whatever's planted most recently. The answer plot system, again, which I believe is the most extensive plot system in the country, or one of the most extensive. Uh, like, in the, like if they had 59 locations, they do have 59 locations in their north group and three reps per location, 25 foot long, meaning they had on 52.59, they had 177 odd times they had observed the yield for that hybrid. In our data set, we observed it 300,000 times that year. Okay? When we sort by a single soil type, we can still have 18,000 observations. Or, or the true power of the true power of big data is my ability to take it to and say, okay, what does this field have in common? Can I get predictive? Can I take big data and make it predictive? Can I say, I only want to look at, in a top performers report, I only want to look at results for hybrids that match this field for soil test fertility, the dominant three soil types, this planting date range, um, this row with this population, this applied nitrogen. And I get a report back like this that, that just kind of rank orders, displays all the information. 
And we know in Premier Crops world, in Premier Crops world, we would never say this is dramatic or significant. But I see people, I see people grab, I see people grab five bushel differences in plot data all the time and make it out like it's significant. And, and the reason I question that is by the time you take that plot data, which was collected in ideal situations, and you roll it out to the diversity of economics and management practices, you really got to wonder. So I'm going to jump back into the big data piece just for a second. And uh, you, guys, you guys live in the same world I do, which you listen to a lot about big data analytics. And these are, some of the, these are some of the entities which are at the forefront of big data analytics. And obviously Google and Netflix and Amazon are three of the consumer product companies and they figured out how to monetize big data analytics. The healthcare system has potential to do great things with big data analytics. Um, and then the government is obviously doing more than we realize. So, the value propositions for me for big data analytics can be these. We can figure out how to monetize it through better value propositions, meaning in the case of some of those companies, it's, it's advertising. But in our world, in our world, right, the way we want to monetize it is through better product positioning. If we can use big data to do a better job of managing the products and, and the practices that, we're, that our growers are using, we will win the sale and we will build a revenue stream. Some companies use big data analytics to differential price. If I know, you know, if I know that the yields from this number are this in this area, that they're 100 bushel less in this area, I can I can figure out where the sweet spot is to price differentially. We can use it to solve real problems, serious problems. In our case, in economics, I, I believe that precision ag data is is the foundation for making for our strategy real and to make the 4-hour strategy actually work. So, so for me, the 4-hour strategy to have legs and for us to solve environmental issues associated with modern agriculture, we have to, we have to do a better job. And to me, analytic, analytics that I'm talking about are part of that. What everybody, the mother load though, the mother load that everybody is after with big data analytics is to be able to reliably predict behavior and so everybody's goal with all of this is to build what? Predictive models or predictive algorithms, okay? Because that's, that's really where the biggest value is. Meaning, I don't have to, I don't have, meaning, think about it, I don't have to have all that yield history, I don't have to have all that yield history on a field if I know all the other characteristics that may fit like another field, that I do have all that data on. I'll show you an example. Let's pretend, let's pretend that in the future, all of us intentionally or accidentally hit a button on a cool app that gave permission, whether we knew it or not, for a company or government or somebody else to own our data or to aggregate our data. So let's pretend that in the future there is some cool iPad app and just it's so cool that you just inadvertently hit the thing because it's so cool but you, know, you may, may or may not realize that you just gave all your data and control up to somebody. But let's pretend that all these entities that we personally involved with somehow got to aggregate all our data. What they would do with it is they would develop a profile. They would look at how you shopped and how you spent money. In my case, what would come out is he buys twice as much as the normal for shaving products. Um, and he's cheap because he buys a lot at Sam's Club. For health, they would see that I lost 10 pounds last year, which my, my doctor using the body mass index says I've gone from uh, obese to grossly overweight. And now, but they would also, if they dug in my history, they would say, hey, he grew up on a farm. He grew up on a farm early in his life, and growing up on a farm might be, in this example, equated to an increased risk of skin cancer because Farm kids were out in the sun at an early age and probably not very well protected. And we know because he grew up on a farm, he may have issues with hearing loss because he grew up with, with loud equipment, in around loud equipment. And so that's an example of where if you had that kind of data set, you could potentially solve a problem and be preemptive, right? Netflix would say we abandon him as a customer because he's not into entertainment. Home Depot would say he buys a lot of drywall. 
the tax return would say this guy's the tax return and other indicators is that this guy may be cheap, may have he may be very conflicted. Seems to you know, may kind of see, seems to have a tea party leanings, doesn't want the government to do everything for us, but turns around and gives a lot of money away. Classified as boring based on web searches, and he works for Premier Crop. So you take all those things together, and what the algorithm does is it comes up with a way to classify a conflicted, cheap, boring, adverse, conservative data need. <laughs> So then you take another individual who happens to work for us, and you run the same analytics, you know, so you run the same analytics, Ben Ray, many of you know. On a purchasing side, he has no addictions like expensive coffee or he drinks water, and, but he does, he clearly does cold sandwiches for lunch, so he also seems to be very cheap. He's in perfect health, but he also spent time on the farm, so he's maybe got the same risk factors, he watches a lot of kids' movies, same Tea Party, he's conservative, but also generous. Classified as boring, he, he thinks that his example, or his idea of porn would be looking at combines online. <laughs> <laughs> so he would come up with the same algorithm. And the idea, the idea of doing this algorithm is predictive modeling, right? So as we can analyze what is similar. So think about it at a field level, similar soil, similar fertility similar uh, management zones, similar management practices, and can we develop predictive analytics? But I got two gotchas in this example. If you're not careful, you build the algorithm, and you won't even realize you had an error in the algorithm. And you'll build it, especially because the, the big goal for most companies is to take the local touch out of this. It's to be able to do this without asking the grower or talking to the grower, or really, maybe, not even including a local advisor in this decision. Because the difference between those two individuals that we profiled is Ben Ray grew up with, instead of riding hay racks, he grew up with big round beds. So he didn't grow up in the sun. He didn't grow up walking beans. He ended up he grew up spraying roundup, right? He didn't grow up with tractors with bad caps because he's that much younger. So the algorithm, the algorithm that could have said skin cancer and hearing loss. Probably not related to him because he's a he's a roundup baby and a nice cat baby, right? <laughs> because I pay so much attention to this stuff, I, it's not lost on me what's going on in the public. And so Snowden kind of unload, unloaded and, and conspiracy, conspiracy theorists and all that just went crazy. But I heard an NSA analyst talking about what they're doing in detail with one of those Charlie Rose type interviews. And he said, people just don't get it. He said, people just don't get it. He says, we have complex algorithms. And we're running them all the time. And he said, let me tell you our actual experience is, about the 20th time, about the 20th time we deliver something that says this is actionable, and they take it to the field, and it's nothing. It, it is no more than crying wolf. He says, we, our experience so far is we keep delivering that the computer and the algorithm say this, and they get to the field, and they're like, what the heck are you serving up? Why don't you know, just quit bugging us? You're, you're actually a distraction. And he specifically used the cry wolf example. It's not, it's not that it's the crystal ball that will remove both the need for local context. Big data and analytics in our world won't be the crystal ball that removes local context. Rather, power of big data analytics in our industry is literally handing the crystal ball and analytical tools to local advisors and growers so that they can have local context. People ask me all the time, can you prove that buying career crop services work, that it's worth it? We're, we're lucky enough in our 15th year, we have a pretty darn good track history or track record with a whole bunch of growers. A couple of years ago, I, pro I, I just did a simple analysis. I picked four of them that had been in the system for over 10 years. I benchmarked it versus the National Ag Statistics County Yield Trends for their county. Their county yield trend is almost like every other county yield trend. It goes up and down based on weather events. But a county average yield trend over 10 years is 2.3 bushels per acre per year. That's what universities say we're on, about 2.3, 2.5 bushels per acre per year. 
And so I benchmark our growers versus that. The first one was three bushel. He averaged three bushel per acre per year. It doesn't sound dramatic, but over the 10 years, if the, if the county average is 23 bushel better, he's 30 bushel better. I'm not, my, my art, my point here is not that his yields were higher than county average. Because trust me, we have growers who farm the worst ground in the county, and their county average might be lower. So I'm not talking about whether you beat county average yields. I'm talking about is your trend line for doing it better? Not, not competitive, is your trend line for doing it better steeper? This guy is four bushel, so county average increased 23 bushel, he increased 40. This guy started way, way, way above, and he finished above, he's at 5.2 bushel. And this guy is 4,500 acres of corn a year, and his average is, his average increase is 7.1 bushels per acre per year. His county average is up 23, he's up 71 on average on 4,100 acres. Can I say that it's working? Can I prove it's working? It's not one silver bullet. It's not one silver bullet, it's a local advisor. It's a local advisor, a local advisor using growers' data, that grower's data, that area's data, bigger data sets, learning, it's crude, it's crude. Some people consider it a barn full of <coughs> collision of uncontrolled variables. But we don't have to hit home runs here. We've got so much room for improvement. As a company, we're pretty darn understated because we understand that and we, we respect the rain barrel and the real world agronomy is, is complex. We believe that there's so much upside and so much that we don't know about crop production and data analysis and data analytics will be the foundation for how we do it better. So I really appreciate the time here. Thanks. Okay. Dan, you do about as good of a job with uh, using corollaries with uh, more common things. I, I could relate to a couple of those questions for Dan on uh, his presentation. If you don't have any questions, I might. So uh, who has a question? Okay, so uh, my question for you is um, we've come a long way in terms of uh, this free movement of data. It seems like you, know, you can make uh, comparisons with uh, government mining and that kind of stuff. Historically, farmers have been really tight with sharing information. Have you seen any change in farmer attitudes on that uh, in, in your time doing this? Uh, we, so, Bruce, in, order, in the early years, in order to, to get it started, we had to, to be really upfront and really clear, and all of our customers are as well. So we all, all of our grower agreements are that the grower owns the data, and it's their data, it comes out whenever they say, um, and it's only aggregated with their permission, so it only becomes part of the community pool with their permission. So, so for us, for us, it's all about them and their data, not our data. So, so because of that, because of being so clear with um, with who owns the data, it hasn't been an issue recently, but I think it will be in the future. Okay. Uh, any additional questions for Dan? Oh yes, sir. Go ahead. Dan, of your long list of variables that, you, that your system supports, can you give us an average number for your typical customer, how many of those variables are populated? Uh, 250, 300. And those are gathered by the, the consultant in most places? Uh, it comes from a combination, so the you know, seven or eight would be public soils type, you know, layers that are tied to the soils. Um, again, like, high, like on the planting file, you know, the, you, you think in the planting world that you're just getting hybrid, but hybrid alone is seven or eight layers because it's disease-resistant traits, chem-resistant traits. I mean, it's, it's a string of it's a string of query, queryable attributes that are tied to that one hybrid decision. Um, you know, planting date. I mean, just like just take the planting planting file. It's, it's population. It's you know genetics with the spring. Um, it's planting speed. Now, now we have now we have four or five new ones that are just tied to the new planters. You know, singulation, downforce, downforce margin. Just so it just you know it just keeps adding as to what we can collect as the device goes across the field. Okay, we probably have time for one additional question. I think we have just a minute or two left in the session. 
And any any final thoughts? Uh, yeah, yes, sir. So, of those 250 or 300 needs that you uh, process for each different uh, field, uh, does, does the I guess local agronomist have to go through and you know look at all that data, or does the computer pick out which ones are worth your time? The very first tool we had was a query tool because we, we have so much respect, fix so much respect for local agronomists and local. You know, like I don't live in southern Minnesota, so why do I think I could? You know, I didn't go through the crop season in southern Minnesota, so wouldn't it be better to be equipped with agronomists that did live in southern Minnesota? With tools? So that's kind of where we. So the initial tool was just a wide open query tool. You know, you can you can query any combination of any attributes in the data. But what we found is it takes time, and not everybody's wired analytically. So as, as we, so what we do is we kind of pay attention to what people are querying and how they're creating value, and then we build standardized or automated reports so that they can get it out of the system faster. And it, you know, every area is different. You know, just can't tell you enough how much how much agronomy is local. So there's some big parameters, but what 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 drives yield is dramatically different based on where you are. Okay, one more if it's quick, uh, yeah, man. Did you address timing, such as having to apply fertilizer to the plant, that sort of thing, looking at this, and I'm sure you've seen results accordingly? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, so timing, it just, yeah, so every, that's what people spend the time, I mean, the ton of time querying, you know, like fall versus spring versus side dress night, which is <coughs> planting dates, and, Combinations of okay, so Dan, thanks very much, and thanks for your work in this industry and helping us understand this better.